So it's blood supply and leaf drainage of the limbs that we are going to discuss today. Okay. Then um, we will first talk about the upper limb. Now uh, this picture is a view from the posterior side. You can recognize by the uh, spine of the scapula and many other things that are there to show that it's the posterior view. Now in that um, in that diagram you can see the arch of the aorta here. Uh, and this is the, uh, the subclavian artery. In this case, is the left subclavian uh, artery. Okay. Now the subclavian artery, um, it's in the root of the neck. Uh, it is divided into three parts, which you will learn when you do the neck. It is divided into three parts based on its relationship to there's a muscle. Uh, if you have the first rib like this, there's a muscle getting attached to the first rib, uh, which is called scalenus anterior. Uh, uh, the, the this is the first strip subclavian artery comes out like this behind it goes behind the scalenus anterior just like the axillary artery going behind the pec minor muscle now based on the the position of the muscle here in relation to the artery uh, it is divided into three parts again like the, your axillary artery so first part then this is the third part and the part behind the muscle is the second part okay now, when the subclavian artery passes uh, distal to the outer border of the first rib, then it is called axillary artery. You know this. Okay. So, in this picture, it's not very clear because it's a posterior view. You don't see the first rib as such very clearly. So, maybe, you know, somewhere here, uh, yeah, it says axillary artery. So, somewhere here, uh, it may be causing the first rib. So, then beyond that, you call it axillary artery. So that is one point that you need to uh, learn from this diagram. Then uh, if you continue the axillary artery, uh, you get uh, starting from the outer borders of the first rib. If you draw your teres major, uh, say uh, if I draw it like this, teres major, if this is teres major, at the lower border of teres major, then the axillary artery, uh, you call it brachial artery. Okay, so beyond that point, you call it brachial artery until it divides here, somewhere here in the cubital fossa, the brachial artery divides into the, its two uh, main terminal branches, the ulna artery and the radial artery. Uh, so its branches and everything uh, we will discuss uh, little by little. Certain branches I might miss, okay, so it doesn't matter, okay, take the big picture. Okay. Um, so that is one thing. Then the other thing uh, about this diagram is that you can see that uh, it's not only the axillary artery that contributes to the blood supply. Uh, I mean, uh, from the subclavian artery as a continuation of the subclavian artery, you can see some other arteries here in relation to the uh, scapula. You can see certain branches arising from the subclavian artery. In this case, it's the first part of the subclavian artery. Uh, gives branches and these branches uh, join the branches arising from the axillary artery here. You can see that. Okay, so this, these branches are coming from the uh, subclavian artery and these branches are coming from the axillary artery. So they, they, they join with each other. You call this anastomosis. Okay, so this is called a scapular anastomosis. Okay, so this is called this area. You can see a very nice scapular anastomosis in the intraspinous uh, fossa, um, that area. So we will discuss that also, which, uh, which is an important uh, thing. At least, you know, we, we question it uh, a lot. Um, so that's the other point that you can uh, take from this uh, picture. If we move to the next slide. Now here, uh, this is a familiar picture. Uh, you have seen this picture in your dissect diagram. Uh, now this is a very nice diagram of how you give these names. So, the subclavian artery up to the outer border of the first rib. Beyond that, it's, uh, it's subclavian artery up here. Beyond that, it's the axillary artery up to the lower border of teres major muscle. Then, beyond that, it's the brachial artery, as I said before. Then, the axillary artery, uh, based on its relationship to pec minor, is divided into three parts. Uh, the part uh, above the pec minor, that is between the outer border of the first rib and the upper border of pec minor. Some people call it medial border, okay, but I would like to call it uh, upper border. Um, then that part is first part. Then the part behind the muscle is the second part. 
and then the, uh, the part below the muscle that is between the lower border of pec minor and the lower border of teres uh, major that part is called uh, the third part uh, then from the first part there is one artery coming out superior thoracic artery from the second part there are two arteries coming out two branches uh, thoracoacromial artery and lateral thoracic artery now even though we call this thoracoacromial artery it's not uh, one artery you sometimes you call it thoracoacromial trunk or acromial thoracic uh, trunk because it gives four uh, branches okay uh, the four branches are one is given uh, to the clavicle which is a clavicular branch then there is a pectoral branch and uh, there is a, an acromial branch and a deltoid branch these are the four branches uh, not that you have to remember all these branches sometimes people ask this but this one becomes important later on uh, because it contributes to the scapular anastomosis okay uh, then the third part gives rise to three branches uh, two circumflex uh, humeral arteries anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries and the subscapular artery uh, now when it comes to the anastomosis scapular anastomosis which we are going to discuss in the next slide this becomes important subscapular artery which is from the third part uh, that is the most important one actually to a lesser extent uh, this contributes to its acromial branch as i said uh, don't get this complicated okay and then the posterior circumflex humeral out of this posterior circumflex humeral also contributes but the most important one is this one subscapular artery okay uh, so this is your um, subscapular artery so here is your subscapular artery is this one this is your subscapular uh, artery uh, with the uh, two branches the circumflex scapular artery and the uh, thoracodosal artery here the circumflex scapular one um, is the most important one for the anastomosis okay okay now this is uh, this picture is to show you the scapular anastomosis uh, now if you go back to the previous one again you can uh, identify the uh, the arteries uh, contributing from the subclavian artery uh, from the first part of the subclavian artery to the scapular anastomosis now here this says deep uh, branch of the transverse cervical artery okay so that is in relation to the vertebral border of the scapula and then there's another artery called suprascapular artery. They are coming from one single trunk, which is called the thyrocervical trunk. Okay, thyrocervical trunk. You will learn these things when you learn the neck. Okay, so that 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 part you will learn later anyway. Then uh, this is the other important artery contributing from the axillary artery side, third part of the axillary artery. So I said that one has uh, two branches. One is circumflex scapular artery which is here coming up here and anastomosing with the branches of the uh, deep cervical artery and the, the suprascapular artery coming here going around the spine and entering the subscapular uh, the intraspinous fossa and uh, forming an anastomosis here then this is this uh, the other branch of the subscapular artery uh, which is called you saw it here this one thoracodosal artery okay so this is thoracodosal branch of the subscapular artery that also anastomosis here you can see anastomosis with the deep uh, branch of the transverse cervical artery now this is an area especially this one trans deep branch of the transverse cervical artery uh, is given different names by different authors because there are variations in certain uh, you know certain people but just remember this version okay remember this version um, but at the same time remember that there are other versions of it it's slightly different from this one don't get confused okay don't get confused okay in you know coming back to this picture okay now this is the one uh, which is called suprascapular artery coming from the first part of the subclavian artery um, and this is the vertebral border remember uh, this is the lateral side okay uh, then this is the deep branch of the uh, transverse cervical artery that is the contribution from the first part of the subclavian artery first part of the subclavian artery then uh, from uh, you don't see the, uh, the subscapular artery as such but you see its branches here this is the circumflex scapular branch the thoracodosal one which comes here it's not drawn in this diagram this is from a different book okay this is from Moore's I think okay 
So the bracket dorsal will come like this, which is also a continuation of the subscapular artery as a branch. So that is basically, so you get the anastomosis um, here, especially in the intraspinous fossa. Uh, then, then there is an extension to that anastomosis. There is an extension to that anastomosis. If I move on to the next slide, now here, there is a branch given from the suprascapular artery, which is called acromial branch. It's the acromial branch. I have written it. Okay. Acromial branch uh, from the suprascapular artery. This one I am referring to. Okay. Acromial branch. Shall I remove this? Acromial branch of the suprascapular uh, artery. Anastomosis around the acromial, acromion with the acromial branch of the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Okay, which is from the third part of the axillary artery again. Then acromial branches of the thoracoacromial trunk. Okay, that is from the second part of the axillary artery. So this is another extension. It's like an extension to the, uh, the main scapular anastomosis. So if somebody asks you about the scapular anastomosis, so any question related to scapular anastomosis, then uh, it's better to mention this extension also. You might not call it extension. You mentioned the first one, the main uh, scapular anastomosis, this one, that is the most important one. Sometimes in the marking scheme, only this part can be there. Okay. Uh, but um, if the examiner wants, he can put this uh, extension also because anyway, that's contributing to the, uh, the main scapular anastomosis. So it's, it's not difficult, just remember the whole thing in that way. Uh, so what the advantage is having a scapular anastomosis, this is also called collateral circulation. Uh, the advantage is if there is a block, say if there is a block uh, in this area, if there is a block in this area, okay, or it can go down to the second part also because its main anastomosis is the third part. So anyway, you know, if there is a block in that area, blood can, uh, if if you grow uh, your scalenous muscle like this, if this is the first part of the subclavian, blood can can flow from the first part of the subclavian artery uh, to the third part of the axillary artery as you have seen sometimes it can go to the thoracoacromial trunk also uh, through the acromial part of the scapular anastomosis sometimes okay so this is the main one okay uh, so then the idea is this so if you have a proximal block there is always uh, an alternative way of supplying the link but remember the fact if this block is very Rapid. So, if it is a sudden block, say you fall from a height and there is a fracture of somebody and the artery gets kinked like this, bent, and the blood supply stops suddenly, that will not be highly unlikely that the limb will be saved if you don't immediately do something. But on the other hand, if there is a very gradual block, like in the case of uh, an atherosclerotic plaque, how the formation of atherosclerotic plaques inside the blood vessels, you will learn when you do your pathology. So basically it's like this, when you have a blood vessel like that, uh, when you have high cholesterol levels, uh, the cholesterol get deposited in the, uh, the, the inner, the mucosa of the, uh, the artery and it, they become larger and larger over the years, uh, uh, obstructing the uh, blood flow. Okay, so it's a very small area that you get to. Since it is gradual, there's enough time for these collateral vessels to open up. Okay, otherwise they, they, they remain very small because the usual blood flow is not through them. So in a gradual obstruction, these collateral vessels will open up and uh, you, you get a fairly good collateral circulation from the first part of the subclavian to the third part of the axillary. So in, in such a person, uh, the limb is saved because of this collateral circulation. So that's an important point for you to remember. Then the other point that you need to remember is that both in the upper limb and lower limb, uh, there are two important, two or three important anastomoses, like the scapular anastomosis in the upper limb and the, 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 acrom, the, the trochanteric and cruciate anastomosis in the lower limb. But that does not mean those are the only anastomoses that you get there. At all joints, around all joints, uh, you, you take the, um, uh, the elbow joint, you take the wrist joint, uh, you take uh, knee joint, ankle joint, uh, all these places, there is some sort of anastomosis. Okay, 
uh, which you don't question me on uh, because uh, it's too much for you to remember. But remember the fact that there are anastomoses uh, in other, around other joints also, not only in the scapula or shoulder area. Okay, so this is basically the shoulder joint area. Okay, so that that's um, that much is enough for the, uh, the anastomosis around the uh, scapula. Okay. Uh, then, uh, as I said before, the brachial artery, brachial artery, uh, it gives this uh, profound brachial artery or the deep uh, artery of the arm, uh, which is the, uh, the one that passes with the radial artery in relation to the radial groove. You know that. Uh, then the, the brachial artery continues down and divides into its uh, radial artery, the two terminal branches, radial artery and the ulna artery. Now, even though the diagram does not show it very clearly, the, 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 the main artery, uh, out of the two, the main artery, uh, the larger artery is the ulna artery. Okay, larger one is the ulna artery, but then it gives another branch, which is called the common introsis branch. So immediately after the ulna artery is given off, it gives common introsis artery, which further divides into an anterior introsis and a posterior introsis artery. So you get the brachial artery like this, Divides into radial and ulna arteries. Okay, this is radial to the lateral side, ulna to the medial side. Then this gives common introsis artery. It div divides into anterior and posterior introsis artery. Now, this anterior and posterior introsis arteries, they lie uh, on either side of the introsis membrane. Okay, so that's why you call it anterior and posterior introsis. Now, the anterior introsis artery, which is this one going in front of the uh, introsis membrane. It uh, runs uh, with the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve, uh, which supplies some of the anterior compartment muscle. Then the posterior interosseous artery, which you can see here, passes to the posterior compartment and runs behind the posterior uh, interosseous membrane. Uh, it supplies uh, the muscles of the posterior compartment of the forearm and it goes close with the posterior interosseous nerve. Posterior interosseous nerve is also called the uh, deep branch of the radial nerve, uh, which is the main nerve of the posterior compartment of the forearm. Then there's another point that you can see here. Uh, I think there's another separate slide also on that. Uh, you can see uh, several other branches here. Here, superior ulna collateral, inferior ulna collateral, and anterior and posterior ulna, recurrent arteries, medial collateral, radial collateral, the interosseous recurrent and radial recurrent. All these arteries that I have in circle, they are actually, they are contributing to form the anastomosis around the elbow. So there's a fairly good anastomosis around the elbow joint. Uh, so if you, that's why we said, you know, in the previous lecture, when we talked about Walkman's ischemic contracture, uh, usually, you know, due to supracondylar fractures as a complication of that, when you obstruct the, the brachial artery here or damage it, uh, you, Depending on the uh, the, uh, the degree of the collateral circulation, uh, the, the damage to the forearm muscles, the ischemic damage could vary. Okay, uh, could vary. It's not hundred percent sometimes. Okay, uh, again the, the same rule applies like in the scapular anastomosis. These uh, collaterals are effective only when there is a gradual obstruction rather than a rapid obstruction like. Uh, like in supracondyle fracture. So the same rule applies. Okay. And the names of all these vessels you might not remember. But a basic rule is that if you look at these names, you can see there are two types of names, but it's not the same for you know all the places, but at least around the elbow, you can see uh, the vessels, the small arteries that pass parallel to the main artery and um, uh, and blood flow is also parallel to the main artery, then they are called collateral arteries. Then on the other hand, there are small arteries which uh, take origin from the, from a main artery and, and their flow, blood flow is in the opposite direction from distal to proximal. They are called recurrent. Okay, they are called recurrent. So it's the collaterals that anastomose with uh, recurrent ones. Okay, one example. Now here the superior ulna collateral as you can see here, anastomosis with the posterior ulna recurrent artery. Okay. So from where they start, then where the anastomose, you can, if you are interested, you can look at pictures and learn. I used to tell these students, but uh, 
the understanding in the department is that certain things are too much you know when you go into too much detail which is true so i will uh, not go into details of that so you can go through this slide if you really want to uh, learn about the, the anastomosis so collateral circulation around the elbow joint uh, so all the, the vessels are listed here uh, the collateral ones and the current ones okay then uh, so this is a, a posterior view uh, the posterior compartment uh, this is to show you uh, the relationship between the, uh, the posterior interosseous nerve and the posterior interosseous artery, okay, which I just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's uh, basically about that. Then, uh, then uh, as I said before, it's, it's not only in, you know, in the scapula or elbow area, even in the wrist, you see uh, some degree of anastomosis of vessels. Now there you can see here uh, palmar carpal arch and a dorsal carpal arch. So through these two arches actually you can see many blood vessels are um, anastomosing and forming a, uh, forming a collateral supply. Okay, so which we will not not go into detail. Then uh, I will use the same diagram uh, to summarize. Even though there are several separate slides, better to summarize it here. Now there are. Uh, there are two arches in the uh, in the palm area, superficial arch, palm arch, and the deep palm arch. Now, if you, if you look here, you can see the superficial palm arch is formed by the, the ulnar artery. You can see the ulnar artery, the continuation of the ulnar artery. So this is the continuation of the ulnar artery. Uh, so here it gives a deep branch, deep branch, uh, and continues as the um, the super the main trunk of the ulnar artery and the radial artery on the other hand you can see here radial artery it sometimes gives a superficial branch here this one and it continues as the radial artery so the superficial branch of the radial artery i'll show you a different diagram later superficial branch of the radial artery with the ulnar artery forms the superficial palm arch and the continuation of the radial artery which goes uh, behind the thumb and comes back into the palm uh, under the first uh, dorsal interosseus here. Uh, here, it's, uh, it, uh, it, and it unites with the deep branch of the ulnar artery, which is this one, deep branch of the ulnar artery and forms the deep palm arch. Uh, and through these palm arches, uh, they, they give certain branches and they unite and form digital arteries to supply the fingers, okay? Okay, so this is a better diagram of your superficial palmar arch. Now you see, uh, now this is the thumb side. Okay, so this is the radial artery continuing around the thumb like that. Okay, behind it. And this is the superficial branch of the radial artery. Now this is the ulnar artery. This is the ulnar artery. This is the deep branch of the ulnar artery uh, going with the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. And you remember the Guyan scanner? Okay, so the, the vessels pass underneath that, uh, and this is the superficial palm arch. Superficial palm arch, and this superficial palm arch sometimes this uh, superficial branch of the radial artery is not there. I think in, in a fair number of cases, the superficial branch is not there. So the arch is formed, it's a half arch then. So arch is formed by the so this part is not there then arch is formed by the uh, ulnar artery there. okay so it's in most of the cases it's an incomplete arch i think okay it's, uh, it's uh, the majority is incomplete if i remember it correctly okay uh, then uh, okay now this is the radial artery coming here going behind the thumb like this and entering the palm again uh, under the, the first this is the first dorsal interosseus okay this is the first dorsal interosseus. Okay, it's not adaptocolysis. Okay, adaptocolysis is deep to it. Okay, this must be the adaptocolysis. Okay, uh, so in your in, in the exam, you know, if this is given as a spot, we give it very frequently. That's first dorsal interosseus. Okay, not adaptocolysis. So the, the radial artery goes under that and into the palm to form the deep palm arch. So what is this nerve then? This is the superficial branch of the radial nerve, which is a totally cutaneous nerve. And this is the one that forms the, you know, uh, this uh, area, which is, uh, you know, anesthetized if you, uh, if you, um, 
if you damage you know if you damage this uh, this may be the only area that will get anesthetized because this area even though you call it radial nerve supply you will have a lot of overlaps from r9 median nerves i told you during the last lecture okay okay moving on to the next slide okay now this one gives both arches uh, superficial palm arch and the deep palm arch superficial palm arch and the deep palm arch one thing you can see is that the deep palm arch uh, when you look from front it's uh, it's proximal it's proximal okay it's proximal compared to the superficial palm arch okay uh, so the deep palm arch is formed by the deep branch of the ulnar artery and the continuation of the radial artery behind the thumb okay and the and the two palm arches give these branches we'll give them different names okay you can see the branches they form common nucleosis uh, yeah common palm digital arteries and then uh, the digital arteries okay anyway just remember that they give rise to digital arteries uh, running on the lateral side of the finger So in, in summary, uh, you, you take a diagram like this, uh, you might add the scapula also here, and then uh, you can add the anastomosis. You, you have a diagram like this, a diagram of your oven, and have it as a summary, okay, which gives the main branches and anastomosis. Uh, don't uh, go behind uh, the anastomosis uh, at the wrist. Uh, if you if you're interested, you can remember some of the things uh, in relation to the elbow anastomosis, but not details. We usually don't ask uh, too many questions from that area. Um, that's it. Then the venous drainage of the upper limb. Venous drainage. Uh, here uh, you can see, um, where should I start? You can see there is a dorsal venous arch. On the dorsum of your hand so that's the easiest place to start from the lateral side or radial side from the of the dorsal venous arch um, uh, in relation to the uh, anatomical snuff box area here uh, the cephalic vein starts cephalic vein starts and it runs on the lateral uh, border of the lateral margin of the upper limb both in the forearm and arm then it passes through the delta pectoral groove here so this is you get the deltoid muscle here and the thick major muscle here so between the two you have a groove which is called delta pectoral groove the vein passes the cephalic vein passes through the delta pectoral groove then you have a fascia here between the, uh, the clavicle and the uh, pec minor which is called clavic pectoral fascia you have seen that so this vein cephalic vein pierces clavipectoral fascia and enters the axillary vein immediately before the axillary vein becomes subclavian vein at the outer border of the first tube, thin bone. Okay. Uh, so this is one thing that you need to remember. Then the other thing is from the medial side of the dorsal venous arch, uh, another vein starts which is called the basilic vein. Okay. Which is called the basilic vein, this one. So it runs on the medial border or the margin of the forearm and enters the arm and runs for few inches on the medial uh, border of the arm then it uh, if your deep fascia is like this uh, it pierces deep fascia and goes deep and it uh, it uh, enters uh, the uh, veins uh, two or three veins accompanying accompanying the brachial artery which are called brachial vena committantes okay uh, vena committantes are deep veins so the basilic vein uh, pierces deep fascia of the lower part of the arm and enters the brachial vena committantes and the brachial vena committantes uh, after entering the, uh, the basilic vein uh, they are called axillary uh, vein axillary vein uh, and usually usually the rule is uh, just like the artery if you have your teres major like this uh, both uh, the, the artery axillary artery ends there uh, and becomes the brachial artery and the brachial vena committantes uh, after the basilic vein enters uh, forms the axillary vein also uh, somewhere at the lower border of the teres major okay so even though the veins don't have a fixed rule 
That is how we can describe the main fluids. So you can take it like that. Then about vena cavita uh, both in, in all both upper limbs and lower limbs, uh, these deep veins are called vena cavita uh, If uh, if you have an artery like this, the radial artery, on the artery or brachial artery, you get uh, two or three sometimes vena cavita and sometimes they are uh, they have interconnections also between the two. Uh, now uh, one uh, one importance is that. Uh, this is going taking blood towards the core of the body. Arteries taking blood away from the core of the body to the periphery. So this blood coming from the from the periphery is uh, the temperature is less compared to the blood coming from the core, the center of the body. So anyway, this uh, temperature is going to be lost, uh, and this one has to gain temperature. So because of this relationship, uh, blood coming from the periphery through the vein get heated up. Uh, otherwise, you, you will lose your body temperature by this peripheral blood coming in. Other thing is, when the veins are like this, uh, when the arteries pulsate, there is a pulsation in the artery. So that uh, acts like a you know, local peripheral heart like and pumps uh, blood. It helps to pump blood through the veins because inside the veins you get, anyway, you get uh, valves directed towards the heart. So if you push it from the two sides, blood will only squeeze, uh, only move in that direction, not in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, so there are several reasons like this uh, for having vena committentes, advantages. Uh, okay. So when it comes to upper limb, the, 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 the deep veins are not very important, but uh, lower limb, deep veins become very important. Okay. Then about the lymph drainage. Now, uh, upper limb drains into axillary lymph nodes. Okay, upper limb drains into axillary lymph nodes. And uh, the importance of axillary lymph nodes is not because the upper limb drains into that. Okay, that is also important. But the, why the axillary lymph nodes are so important, the reason for that is the breast actually. It's the breast here, especially in females. Because the breast drains into axillary lymph nodes. About 75% uh, of the lymph uh, from the breast drains into axillary lymph nodes and the breast cancers are you know, um, increasing always. It's on the rise. Uh, it's one of the main cancers that kills people. Uh, and, uh, and when uh, axillary lymph nodes drain the breast tissue, uh, it's very common to get secondary deposits, cancer deposits in the axillary lymph nodes. For that reason, axillary lymph nodes become important. Uh, then, you know, upper limb also drains into axillary lymph nodes. That's a different issue. Now, uh, axillary lymph nodes, there are five groups. There's a, an apical group, there's an anterior group, posterior group, lateral group, and a central group. Okay, this is uh, not axillary. Okay, it's not axillary. So, it's uh, one, two, three, four, five. Apical, anterior, posterior, lateral, and the group in the center of the axilla, which is called the central group. So all lymph, as you can see here, through the arrows, uh, drain into the central group. From lateral, posterior, and anterior. Then from the central, it goes into the apical uh, lymph nodes. Uh, and this, I will come back to this infraclavicular group of lymph nodes. Okay, So they are not considered axillary nodes, but they drain into the apical nodes. Uh, uppermost group of axillary nodes. So, uh, so having that in mind, we look at this diagram. This is a very diagrammatic representation of the um, axillary lymph nodes, but this uh, gives you a good idea. Now, this is uh, your clavicle on the right side, and uh, now your axilla is something like this. Uh, axilla is something like this. You have the flow, then you have the, uh, the upper, uh, upper uh, the apex here. Here is the scapula, this is the first strip, and this is the clavicle. So this is the apex of the axilla. So the apical nodes are in relation to the apex of the axilla. So that is this one. Okay. Now the central group is embedded in the, uh, the tissues in the middle of the axilla. Then uh, the anterior group, it lies in relation to the, now if you draw, this one is the, uh, the pec, pec minor, lateral border of the pectoralis minor. This one is the, the lateral border of the subscapularis muscle. Okay. 
एक माइनस एंटीरियर सबस्केपुलरिस इस पोस्टीरियर यू नो दैट ओके एंड एंड दिस दैट्स हाउ दे आर अरेंज्ड सो द एंटीरियर ग्रुप इस अरेंज्ड इन रिलेशन टू द पेक माइनर एंड द पोस्टीरियर ग्रुप इस अरेंज्ड इन रिलेशन टू द सबस्केपुलरिस मसल सो द दिन द लैटरल वन ना दिस इज अपली लैटरल वन इस इन रिलेशन टू द एक्सिलरी वेन हियर ओके लैटरल वन सो द एंटीरियर एंड पोस्टीरियर वन सा हियर ओके सेंट्रल वन इस समय हियर एपिकल वन इस समय देर ओके सो इफ आई शो यू समथिंग एल्स नाउ दिस एंटीरियर ग्रुप इफ यू लुक एट द एंटीरियर ग्रुप दैट इस नॉट ओनली इन रिलेशन टू द Lateral thoracic artery. You remember lateral thoracic artery, which is a branch from the uh, second part of the axillary artery. Uh, the, uh, the the artery runs in relation. If you have the pic minor like this, pic minor attached to the parietal process, uh, lateral thoracic artery runs like this. Lymph nodes are arranged along the artery like that. Okay, uh, and this lateral thoracic artery again is an important artery, especially in females, because that's a, a main sub blood supply to the uh, the breast. Okay. From the axillary artery, then uh, uh, the 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 subscapular artery, uh, subscapular artery uh, is uh, in relation to the uh, subscapularis muscle here. Sorry, subscapularis muscle here, uh, and uh, the, the the lymph nodes, subscapular uh, group of lymph. We call it scapular group of lymph nodes also, posterior group, lies in relation to the subscapular artery there. Okay. And this anterior group is also called pectoral group because it's relation to the it relates to the pectoralis minor. Pectoral group. This is called subscapular group. Subscapular group. You can understand that, okay? Because of this uh, relationship. Then uh, here, as I said before, uh, lateral group uh, is in the upper end of the uh, arm uh, in relation to the uh, uh, axilla, uh, in relation to the axillary vein. And uh, all this uh, limb ultimately drain into the uh, through the apical nodes. They can go into the supraclavicular nodes, which belongs to neck lymph nodes, which belongs to neck lymph nodes, or they drain into the uh, the, the thoracic duct uh, directly or through the right lymphatic duct, right lymphatic duct. Okay. Uh, so sometimes you get right lymphatic duct, sometimes you don't get it. Okay. Uh, Then lymph drainage of the upper limb. Uh, it's uh, easy to remember lymph drainage of the upper limb. Um, now you have already learned about the lateral uh, group, lateral group of the axillary lymph nodes, uh, and uh, this infraclavicular group. Uh, it's not uh, axillary nodes, but it's very closely related to axillary nodes. Now the medial side, uh, that is this side, medial side of the hand and forearm. Okay, hand and forearm along the basilic vein. Okay, basilic vein is in that area. Along the basilic vein, drains into a small group of lymph nodes in the uh, in the supratrochlear. You have the trochlea here. You remember the trochlea of the humerus. Uh, above the trochlea, you have the supratrochlear lymph node group. Uh, so this lymph from the medial side of the hand and forearm drains into the supratrochlear group of nodes. Um, and from the lateral side, superficially. Okay, I'm referring to the superficial limb here. From the lateral side, along the cephalic vein, uh, it drains into the lateral group of. Uh, uh, it drains into the infraclavicular group. Okay, infraclavicular uh, group of uh, lymph nodes. Okay, from the lateral side. And when it comes to deep limb, all lymph from the deep structures will go into um, go into the lateral group of axillary nodes then from there into central and apical uh, groups and uh, whatever that went into the supratrochlear group of nodes also ultimately go into the lateral group and continue now this is not very difficult thing okay? so they just you know drain into any lymph node that is uh, on their way okay so remember it that way okay so okay try to answer this
this is a straightforward question because we just discussed this. Uh, it says when the distal end of the subclavian artery is occluded, uh, so distal end means you know maybe the second or third part. Uh, blood will flow from the proximal subclavian artery, maybe the first part, to the axillary artery through the following arteries. So suprascapular, thoracoacromial, circumflex scapula, lateral thoracic, posterior circumflex humeral. So except lateral thoracic, all other uh, branches are correct. Okay, all other branches are uh, correct. Then we will move on to the lower limb. Uh, now, uh, the same thing, you know, we'll go through the uh, arteries and then the veins and then lymph drainage. Okay. Okay, now the gluteal uh, region, thigh and popliteal fossa. Disturbing not to have this popliteal uh, fossa. Now, uh, again, you know, this is uh, a bit complicated, but uh, I'll try to, uh, I'll, I'll try to, summarize in at least uh, some of uh, it now you take it like this now you have the aorta okay aorta in the posterior abdominal wall these things we will learn later posterior abdominal wall um, it divides aorta bifurcates you call it bifurcation okay that level is l4 lower border okay aorta divides uh, into its two terminal branches the, the common iliac arteries, okay, there are two common iliac arteries, left and right, at the lower border of L4, okay, and uh, the two common iliac arteries divides into, uh, they divide into uh, internal iliac artery and the external iliac artery in front of the sacroiliac joint. Now, this is uh, sacroiliac joint, in front of the sacroiliac joint. Then the internal iliac artery, this one, um, is uh, is the main artery that supplies pelvic organs, uh, pelvic organs and the perineal uh, organs. Okay, so the internal iliac artery has about nine branches, especially in females, because they have the uterus and the vagina, so you get some extra arteries originating from that. Uh, so there are nine branches. Typically, you remember it as nine branches from the internal iliac artery, and some of these branches will go into the gluteal region uh, which as you can see here so these are branches of the internal iliac artery so ultimately they come out to the gluteal region superior gluteal and inferior gluteal arteries that you have seen during a dissection are branches of the, uh, the internal iliac artery then in the medial compartment when you dissect the medial compartment you must have seen uh, i don't know whether you have seen it's all videos obturate artery going with the obturator nerve the nerve of the adductor compartment of the thigh this obturate artery is also a branch from the internal iliac artery. So there are several other branches which I will not go into the details of. Then the, the external iliac artery, external iliac artery on the other hand, uh, passes posterior or deep to the inguinal ligament. And at that point, just like the axillary artery is formed you know, from the subclavian artery at the outer border of the first rib, uh, the external iliac artery becomes femoral artery uh, distal to the inguinal ligament. Then before it uh, passes beyond the inguinal ligament, it gives few branches okay, that supplies the anterior abdominal wall. Okay, it gives inferior epigastric artery, which is an important artery when it comes to the inguinal region that becomes a landmark uh, for you to uh, identify medial and um, uh, the, the direct and indirect inguinal hernia. You will learn that later when you do the abdomen. Then, uh, then you know, this is a branch that supplies the um, anterior abdominal wall. Then, uh, after it passes uh, under the inguinal ligament, it becomes a femoral artery. As I said, uh, the main artery of the uh, lower limb. Then, uh, below the inguinal ligament, uh, and the other thing is, I mean, when it enters the lower limb uh, with the femoral vein, it passes through a fascial sheath, which is called the femoral sheath, which is a continuation of the transversalis uh, fascia and the iliacus fascia. Iliacus fascia is here. Okay, transversalis fascia is on the anterior abdominal wall in aspect. Now, anyway, we will learn these things later. So it passes to the lower limb uh, through this fascial covering, which is called the uh, femoral sheath. 
Um, and uh, while it is in the femoral sheath, it gives several branches, um, which are called, uh, there are four branches, okay. It's superficial circumflex iliac and the superficial epigastric, I don't know where it is, okay. Uh, superficial epigastric, uh, it's not drawn here, okay. So superficial epigastric is going in that direction, okay, towards the umbilicus. Superficial circumflex iliac, superficial epigastric can, uh, superficial and deep external pudendal arteries, uh, which are not so important, but uh, those are the first few arteries that are given from the femoral artery. Then the femoral artery uh, gives uh, its profunda brachii artery, okay, deep artery of the thigh. Uh, so profunda brachii artery is also called uh, deep femoral artery, I told you before, and uh, the main femoral artery in that case, main femoral artery, if you call this deep femoral artery, then uh, this has to be called superficial femoral artery. But anatomists use this, you know, deep uh, uh, deep artery of the thigh for profunda femoris artery. And for this one, we call femoral artery. But clinicians, especially radiologists, use this uh, deep femoral artery and superficial femoral artery terminology. Then uh, from the profunda brachii artery, then there are several branches. Uh, we will do that, you know, in a different slide. It's not uh, very clear here. Uh, so the profunda brachii uh, artery is the main artery of the thigh, and again in the in the uh, in the knee joint area you can see a very nice anastomosis there with several blood vessels getting involved. Okay, then the other point is uh, the femoral artery uh, passes through the adductor canal here, and there is what is called adductor hiatus opening in the adductor magnus muscle. And beyond adductor hiatus, again the name changes, the femoral artery becomes popliteal artery because the popliteal fossa is in that area. Okay. Uh, then the popliteal artery uh, gives several branches here, genicular branches, and uh, it divides into its two, two terminal branches, anterior and posterior tibial arteries. Okay. So, so these are the few branches that I mentioned uh, that are given at the beginning of the femoral artery, uh, the four branches. Then the deep artery, as you can see here, deep artery of the thigh or the profunda femoris artery, uh, the two main... <laughs> yes, can someone mute yourself? Okay. Then, um, then the profunda femoris artery has... Uh, uh, it gives uh, a branch which is called lateral circumflex femoral and another branch called medial circumflex femoral. So the lateral one starts from the lateral side of the deep artery and the medial one starts from the medial side of the deep artery. But they, uh, the, their relationship to the femur is uh, the lateral one is anterior and the medial one is posterior. Then uh, the, the continuation of the deep artery, uh, it gives several uh, perforating arteries as you can see here, several perforating arteries. Then uh, femoral artery passes through the uh, adductor canal and uh, deep artery uh, and femoral artery. Uh, the, the adductor longus muscle is sandwiched between the, the two uh, vessels. These details are not necessary for you. I think you know that already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then uh, this is a summary of the, the branches of the, uh, the profunda femoris artery. I will not go into the details of that. I'll just skip that. Okay. Uh, then uh, this slide I showed you uh, in one of the previous uh, lectures. Um, uh, in, a, in an arteriogram, when a dye is injected, uh, this is the superficial femoral artery or the main femoral artery and this is the deep femoral or the profunda uh, femoris artery which <coughs> lies between the, uh, the femoral artery and the, uh, the bone itself. Okay. Then these two anastomoses, cruciate and trochanteric anastomoses, uh, these uh, anastomoses are um, out of the two, this is the most important one, trochanteric, uh, because that is the main one that supplies the head of the femur. Now, how they are formed, if you can see here, you can see superior gluteal artery here, superior gluteal artery, uh, and you can see the medial and lateral circumflex uh, femoral arteries. So, the anastomose. Uh, and form the, uh, the trochanteric anastomosis. Uh, the descending 
branches superior gluteal with the ascending branches to the medial and lateral circumflex femoral uh, arteries. I think inferior gluteal is also involved in that. Just check whether inferior gluteal artery is also involved. Okay. I don't know whether I missed it here. Okay. Uh, so it's anyway between the uh, superior gluteal artery, which is a branch from the obturator, uh, which is a branch from the internal iliac artery. I told you before, uh, the, a branch from the internal iliac artery, anastomosis with branches from the femoral uh, artery. So it's profunda brachii is a branch from the femoral artery. So the issue here is if you have a, a proximal block, like in the case of axillary, uh, the subclavian and axillary arteries, if you have a block somewhere here in front, okay, uh, to the femoral artery, to the proximal part of the femoral artery, blood can flow from the internal iliac artery to the distal part of the femoral artery through the profunda uh, femoris artery, deep artery of the thigh, because of this anastomosis. Okay. Uh, then the other thing is cruciate anastomosis. Uh, the trochanteric one is in relation to the greater trochanter here, that area. Okay. Cruciate one is in relation to the lesser trochanter, that is in this area. Okay. Uh, and that the anastomosis is between the, the transverse branches of the medial and lateral circumflex arteries and the descending branches from the inferior gluteal, which is this one, descending branches, which are these, and the ascending branches of the, uh, the first perforating artery. So this is the, the, the first perforating artery. Okay, you can see the ascending branches going up like that. So that is the, uh, uh, the, the cruciate anastomosis. Uh, so that's uh, it about the anastomosis. Then the, the an important topic, blood supply of the head of the femur. Uh, now, uh, this blood supply of the head of the femur, uh, this is an important, uh, important uh, discussion. Now, the blood supply, uh, there are two sources of, two or three sources of blood supply. Now, one supply is uh, through the nutrient artery. Okay, it passes through the bone and passes through the neck, uh, which is, you know, deep. Uh, so, that is one supply through the nutrient artery. Okay, then the other supply in children uh, before puberty, uh, and especially before the epiphyseal plate is closed, because you get what is called epiphyseal plate here. Uh, so before the epiphyseal plate um, is uh, closed, closed means, you know, uh, closed means that the growth has stopped. Okay. So before it is closed, there's a branch from the obturator artery, again, the internal iliac branch, uh, obturator artery passes through the ligament of the head of the femur uh, and supplies the head of the femur. Uh, that is in children. In, in adults, this artery is uh, no longer effective. It's not enough to supply the head of the femur. Uh, so the other important supply, especially in, in adults, is uh, the, 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 the trochanteric anastomosis. Out of the trochanteric anastomosis also, it's the mainly it's the medial circumflex femoral artery through the trochanteric anastomosis that supplies the head of the femur. So, so in, in a child, you get this uh, artery coming through this one as well as blood coming from the, this side. Okay. So if there's a fracture of the neck of the femur, uh, the head is not uh, seriously at risk because it has another blood supply. But in adults, this uh, blood supply through the ligament of the head of the femur is uh, very poor or you know, totally absent. Therefore, they totally depend on the blood supply through the neck of the femur, uh, um, mainly through the medial circumflex uh, coming through the trochanteric anastomosis. Okay. Then how they are arranged is like this. Now you have the head here. Then you have the neck. Okay. Uh, so you have this uh, high line cartilage here covering this. Now the, you, you, if you have the acetabulum here, now the capsule, if you have the greater trochanter like this, you have the capsule coming here and getting attached to the, uh, getting attached to the capsule coming here, getting attached to the intertrochanteric line on the anterior side. And the fibers, uh, they, uh, I, I'm drawing on the anterior side, okay. And the, and the fibers of the capsule are reflected backwards like this to this border of the hyaline cartilage. 
and there they are attached. These fibers are called retinacular fibers. These fibers are called retinacular fibers. And the blood vessels taking origin from the medial circumflex and the branches of the trochanteric anastomosis, they pass, now if these are retinacular fibers are like that, blood vessels pass in between these retinacular fibers. Therefore, these vessels are called retinacular arteries. Okay, retinacular arteries. So they pass like that uh, and, uh, and, if, and that is the main source of blood supply to the head of the female adults. And if you break the neck, if you fracture the neck in that area, uh, that will damage the retinacular vessels. And the head of the femur uh, is at risk uh, because there is not enough blood supply. Then the other point is, uh, now in front, the capsule is attached to the intertrochanteric line, but this is at the back posteriorly. This is called intertrochanteric crest. Line is in front, crest is behind. You can see the capsule does not come right up here. Okay, it falls short. It's attached to the uh, neck actually here. Okay, then you get the retinacular fibers going up with the retinacular vessels in between. Okay, uh, so if you have the capsule going like this, the synovial membrane also will go like that, and that's so the blood vessels will be in between the retinacular fibers. Okay, so sometimes when they describe the Retinacular vessels, they, they call them subsynovial. Subsynovial means this. if you look from this side, if your eye is here, if this is your eye, if you look from there, then it's under the synovial membrane, so you call it subsynovial. Okay, if you put a laparoscope or something into the joints, nowadays they do it, okay, and look at this, then it's subsynovial. Okay, so that's how you name it. If you read books only, you will find these issues, okay. So, uh, so if you if you fracture here, if you fracture here, then uh, the risk will not be there because the blood supply will be maintained, especially on the posterior side. If the fracture line goes like this, they are very safe. On the other hand, if you fracture uh, here or in between or even here, then uh, depending on the number of vessels damaged, the risk would be there. Then the branches of the popliteal artery, uh, they are five genicular arteries. Now the middle, gen middle genicular artery out of the five is important uh, because it, uh, it, it pierces the, uh, the, the capsule of the knee joint posteriorly with the oblique popliteal ligament and it supplies the cruciate ligaments, middle genicular artery. Then uh, the popliteal artery, uh, usually the popliteal arteries, if your joint line is like this, knee joint line, uh, it's uh, a hand's breadth, I don't know how to draw it. It's the hand's breadth above to hand's breadth below the knee joint. Uh, so hand's breadth is five centimeters, okay. Hands are, you know, has, they have different breadths, okay. So it's five centimeters above to five centimeters below the knee joint line. Uh, or you can call it, it's from the adductor hiatus. If somebody asks, you know, the extent of the popliteal artery, these are the ways you can describe the extent. Okay. Either hands breadth above to hands breadth below, 5 centimeters above to 5 centimeters below the joint line. <coughs> or you can say uh, from the, uh, the opening of the adductor hiatus to the uh, soleal arch. So the soleus muscle has an arch like this, uh, like flexibilitarum superficialis of the forearm. So that is the popliteal artery. Okay. So that's exact, you know. Others measurements are very relative, okay, depending on the size of the hand. And... Okay, so these are the genicular arteries I mentioned, superior and inferior, medial and lateral. Those are the five and there's a, there's a middle one here. And then the two terminal arteries, the anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries. Now the anterior tibial one, uh, so your, your soleal, uh, sorry. Uh, your soleal uh, attachment is somewhere here. Okay, soleal arch is somewhere here. Then anterior tibial one uh, passes to the front through the uh, interosseous membrane and uh, be the artery of the anterior compartment. Posterior tibial artery is the artery of the posterior compartment. Okay. <laughs> then uh, this slide shows you the anastomosis uh, around the knee joint. So you can see the vessels responsible 
uh, you don't have to remember all this. Okay, just remember that there is an anastomosis around the new joint. Okay, so you can remember all this stuff. So this is uh, you know a summary of the uh, the vessels in the leg. Okay, so go through this carefully. The arteries I mentioned. Only thing I didn't mention was this one, peroneal artery. It's an important artery. It's the artery of the lateral compartment. It's actually a branch coming from the posterior tibial artery. You can see that it's branching off from the posterior tibial artery. Uh, it never enters the lateral compartment, uh, even though it supplies the lateral compartment. It remains in the posterior compartment and sends branches to supply the lateral compartment. Okay. So if someone says popliteal artery uh, lies in the lateral compartment, it's wrong. Okay. It supplies the lateral compartment, uh, but lies in the posterior compartment. You can see this fact here. Now, this is a posterior tibial artery and this is fibular artery or peroneal artery. Okay. Uh, so, so then uh, you can see it here. This is anterior compartment. Your fibula is longest than previous. Yes, this is flexor hallux is longest. Okay. So, this is the lateral compartment. Okay. Lateral compartment. So, the Peroneal arteries in the posterior compartment it sends branches to the muscles in the lateral compartment. Okay. Then uh, uh, the anterior tibial artery. Now this is an anterior view. Uh, this is a dorsal side rather. Okay. So this is the dorsal side. This is the plantar side of the foot or the sole. Sole of the foot. Okay. Now uh, the 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 anterior tibial artery. Uh, when it crosses the, the ankle joint and enters the foot, then it is called dorsalis pedis artery. Okay. It is called dorsalis pedis artery. This one. Okay. Okay. It's called dorsalis pedis artery. So that uh, artery supplies the foot. Details of it you don't need. Then on the other hand, the posterior tibial artery, okay, coming through the posterior compartment, uh, it divides into a medial plantar artery and the lateral plantar artery. Medial one is a small one, lateral one is the main one. So the lateral plantar artery actually forms a palm, uh, plantar arch here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's usually, you know, mostly it's the it's an incomplete arch. Even though the medial plantar artery is there, it's too small to contribute to it. Uh, so it's from the lateral plantar artery, the plantar arterial arch is formed. Then you get the digital branches as in the upper leg. Okay, so this is a, uh, a nice diagram of that. So this is the lateral plantar artery, uh, branch of the posterior tibial artery, forming the uh, plantar arch. And the medial one is not uh, big enough to contribute to it. Okay. Then about the superficial veins of the uh, lower limb, uh, superficial veins are more important when it comes to the lower limb, I think. Uh, and uh, the superficial veins here, uh, this is how you remember it. Just like in the upper limb, you get a dorsal venous arch on the dorsum of the foot, dorsal venous arch. From the medial side of the dorsal venous arch, uh, immediately in, in front of the, um, no, it's from the medial aspect of the dorsal venous arch in the foot, uh, the great satinous vein starts. Great satinous vein starts. Then it runs on the medial uh, border of the leg uh, at the knee joint it passes five centimeters okay five centimeters so hands breadth behind the medial border of the patella behind this okay and then in the thigh it curves forward uh, and comes to the front of the thigh um, and passes through the saphenous opening okay and enters the femoral vein enters the femoral vein so here this junction is called saphenofemoral junction and there is a valve also there. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, people who get varicose veins, uh, dilated veins of the lower limb, uh, issue is some, sometimes here. Uh, the saphenofemoral junction, the valve is weak. So you get blood coming in the backward direction. Okay. So you will learn these are clinical things. Okay. Uh, so, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some of these things uh, in this lecture also. Then, um, from the lateral side of the 
uh, then you know this great satinous vein remember it runs immediately uh, in front of the medial nodules okay that's a very stable uh, position so if you cannot find any other vein in the body this is the place to find the vein okay great satinous vein immediately in front of the medial nodules okay and the other point is that it accompanies the satinous nerve okay satinous nerve here okay uh, and uh, from the lateral side of the the dorsal venous arch of the foot starts the um, small uh, small satinous vein small satinous vein and uh, it uh, runs on the, the the posterior side of the leg together with the sural nerve sural nerve is there and it uh, pierces deep fascia of the popliteal fossa and enters the popliteal vein okay popliteal vein so this is uh, then you know the other thing is now you remember the four branches given off from the femoral artery now there are venous tributaries entering the uh, the, the great satinous vein uh, with the same names okay uh, superficial circumflex iliac superficial epigastric superficial and deep external duodenal okay uh, because uh, when you have incompetence here uh, there is a surgery called high tie you tie the vein here you have to tie these vessels also otherwise this vein gets refilled coming blood coming through them okay so that's a little bit you know, too much for you okay then another point now there are several tributaries to the great satinous vein you can see okay these are all tributaries entering the great satinous vein uh, but uh, you need to remember an important uh, tributary okay so these are the four branches that i mentioned okay joining uh, then there is an important these are other tributaries that uh, you know enter it an important tributary which is called um, posterior arch vein that's a tributary an important tributary of the great satinous vein uh, now if this is medial nodules great satinous vein lies immediately in front posterior arch vein lies immediately behind the medial nodules okay now why is posterior arch vein important because it has a lot of connections with deep veins okay now when it comes to deep veins uh, deep veins i told you that in the upper limb and lower limb deep veins follow arteries as vena comitantes now if you know the arteries this uh, the same diagram that we used before you can remember the veins now these are the veins okay so you have an anterior tibial vein and a posterior tibial vein a peroneal vein opening into the posterior tibial vein then you have the popliteal vein and the femoral vein okay that's how it is then if you add the superficial veins to the deep veins where the deep veins are in black and superficial veins are in blue now i uh, i followed the, the diagram given in uh, chaurasia some of you read chaurasia um, so i i used that diagram you know, i i read it that diagram it's a very nice diagram you know, as a summary okay uh, so here you can see uh, this is dorsal venous arch dorsal venous arch from the medial side you get the great satinous vein and the lateral side you get the small satinous vein small satinous vein enters into the popliteal vein here you can see there and the great satinous vein enter the femoral vein here at the satinofemoral junction okay and uh, you can see uh, other deep veins here the posterior tibial anterior tibial and peroneal veins uh, and most importantly the posterior arch vein the tributary of the great satinous vein now there are connections between deep veins and superficial veins even in the upper limb there are connections between superficial veins and deep veins but we don't talk much about these things because uh, you don't have many clinical issues related to it but when it comes to the lower limb these connections between superficial veins and deep veins become so important okay so there are several places where you get these connections now here if you have the knee joint here above knee above the knee there is a, uh, these are called perforating veins okay there is a perforating vein called perforators connecting the um, the great satinous vein to the um, now this is about the adductor canal so it's the femoral vein here okay it's connect the great satinous vein to the femoral vein then below the knee joint which is called below knee perforator uh, either the great satinous vein or the posterior arch vein is connected to the posterior tibial vein then lower down there are about three these things can vary there are about three medial perforators okay uh, uh, one 
you know, in the lower part of the leg and two, in relation to the medial malleolus. I will not give you details, okay, otherwise you will try to remember all these things. Then there's, you know, usually there's only more medial perforators than lateral perforators. So there are several medial perforators you can see in the lower part of the leg. There's one lateral perforator usually uh, between the peroneal vein and the, uh, the small satinous vein. And always these perforators are between superficial veins and deep veins. Okay. So the purpose is uh, for the blood. Ah, I was supposed to have another slide. Okay. Anyway, you know, you, you have your, say, if this is your deep fascia, I'll draw this deep fascia. And if this is your superficial veins here, okay. And if these are your deep veins, so the perforating veins will pass through the deep fascia and connect up with the deep veins. So when, um, when you walk, now these deep veins are located inside the muscles. When the muscles contract, deep vessels get squeezed. And if you look inside the deep vein, they have valves directed towards the heart. Then this is squeezed from either side by the contraction of muscles, blood will flow towards the heart. And when the muscles relax, the other direction, when the muscles relax, then when this opens up, uh, blood cannot flow backwards because the valves will close up. Okay, so uh, so what happens is when you walk uh, and when you contract your uh, calf muscles, um, blood will always flow in the deep veins towards the heart. Okay, if this is your heart, blood will always flow through the deep veins towards the heart, and they will never come back because of the valves. If the valves are good, okay, if they are defective, then there is a problem. Now for this reason. This is called muscle pump, therefore. Okay. And it's mainly the soleus muscle that is responsible for it. Uh, and therefore, you sometimes call it soleal pump. Soleal pump. And then what happens is, when the blood in the deep veins, I'll, I'll remove this and draw a different one. When the, when the blood in the deep veins are pushed towards the heart, pressure inside the deep veins drop when the muscles relax. And the blood in the superficial veins will be pulled into the deep veins through the perforating veins. Through the perforating veins. Again, valves in the perforating veins are directed towards the deep, deep veins. So blood will flow from the superficial veins into the deep veins. Okay. And when the muscles contract, blood will no, not go back because these valves will close. Okay. But the issue here is when the deep vein valves are defective, for some reason, when the deep vein valves are defective, okay, then when the muscles contract here, blood will flow backwards through the perforator valves because they will damage the perforator valves also. And then blood will get collected in the superficial veins. Okay. Or when there is an issue somewhere here, again, you know, it's between deep, deep and superficial veins. If the valve here is defective, okay, even though there are no perforators as such there, again, blood will flow from the deep the femoral vein into the great satinous vein. Ultimately, uh, when the blood gets collected there, what happens to the veins is that if initially the vein was like this, now the vein is like this, it's elongated. Okay. And it's dilated. Okay. It's larger now because the blood volume is high. And it, 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 it's not only elongated now because it cannot stay in one place, it becomes like this. So there are three points. It's uh, dilated, elongated and tortuous. Tortuous means it has a lot of bends like that. Okay. Uh, so dilated, elongated, and tortuous superficial veins, uh, especially in the in the lower lip, are called varicose veins. Okay. If somebody asks you what are varicose veins, that's how you describe it. Okay. Okay, so we have given questions, uh, several questions uh, about uh, deep veins and superficial veins and how the blood drains from superficial veins to deep veins and about varicose veins in, in previous uh, question papers. Oh, 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 this is an area for you to study very well. Okay. Then about the lymph drainage of the uh, lower limb. Uh, now the lymph drainage in the lower limb is uh, much more important than the lymph drainage of the upper limb. Okay. Now this is how you divide the lymph nodes in the lower limb. It's very easy. You have superficial lymph nodes and deep lymph nodes. Okay. So if this is your fascia lata, oh sorry, if this is your fascia lata, superficial lymph nodes are superficial to fascia lata. Deep lymph nodes are deep to fascia lata. So that's the basic thing. 
and the superficial lymph nodes uh, are related to the superficial veins like great satinous vein and the deep lymph nodes are related to the deep veins like femoral vein and the popliteal vein anyway now the superficial uh, lymph nodes superficial group of lymph nodes you divide them into two groups there is a horizontal group in relation to the inguinal ligament just below the inguinal ligament then there is a vertical group in relation to the great saphenous way okay in relation to the great saphenous way and this uh, okay now uh, the two groups of leaf nodes we mentioned the superficial group and the deep group uh, superficial group uh, lies immediately below the inguinal ligament uh, the, the, the horizontal part of the superficial group lies immediately below the inguinal ligament and the vertical group lies in relation to the great saphenous way yeah? and uh, and the horizontal group horizontal part of the superficial group can be divided into a lateral group and a medial group okay uh, so that's how you divide the superficial lymph nodes the medial group is more important it drains uh, the anterior abdominal wall below the umbilicus superficial limb then it drains the perineum okay it drains the perineum when you say perineum uh, skin of the scrotum labia majors then um, you get um, lower part of the inner canal lower part of the vagina um, all these things plus uh, the cone of the uterus now the uterus is like this okay so there is what is called round ligament coming into this area in the females so this uh, through the round ligament some lymph from the cone of the uterus also can come into the medial group of superficial inguinal nodes then the lateral group superficial inguinal nodes not very important they drain the flank here and the buttock area okay so this one is important then the vertical group of superficial inguinal nodes in relation to the great saphenous vein drains all superficial lymph except the posterior lateral aspect of the leg uh, because that area is drained uh, through the lymphatics uh, in relation to the small saphenous vein into the popliteal group of lymph nodes directly they drain into the popliteal group therefore uh, that part the the, the the posterior lateral part of the leg will not drain into the vertical group uh, others will drain okay if you read this slide uh, you can see the summary of uh, all the areas drained by lymph nodes now when it comes to deep inguinal nodes which are in relation to the femoral artery uh, all deep lymph and the lymph from the popliteal nodes they drain into the deep inguinal nodes then if you remember when we did the anterior compartment we said uh, sorry we said the femoral sheath femoral sheath is like this you have the femoral artery you, you have the femoral vein and you have the uh, femoral canal here now the deep inguinal nodes in relation to the femoral vein this is vein deep inguinal nodes upper end of that will uh, lie in the femoral canal and these nodes are called nodes of clocket nodes of clocket i don't know whether i wrote it somewhere yeah it's not here nodes of clocker um, and they drain actually the uh, glands penis in males and glands in males and clitoris in females okay glands in males and clitoris in females uh, so those are the deep inguinal nodes in the uh, femoral canal uh, okay so this i have mentioned okay um, other things you can read from this side. okay then uh, all lymph uh, from the inguinal nodes uh, the superficial ones actually go into the deep nodes uh, some do not go but ultimately they go into the external uh, iliac group of lymph nodes external iliac group of lymph nodes from there into the common iliac group then uh, into the para aortic groups because in the abdomen it, the aorta is like this <coughs> aorta has uh, paired blood vessels like this from the sides and central blood vessels like that so lymph nodes in relation to this lateral blood vessels are called paraiotic nodes and blood vessels in relation to this central blood vessels are called uh, lymph nodes in relation to the central blood vessels are called preaortic pre and para so this inguinal lymph ultimately go into paraiotic lymph nodes okay paraiotic lymph nodes and from there into this cisterna chile uh, which is a sac like thing a few centimeters long um in relation to the l1 i think l1 and l2 lumbar vertebral bodies uh, from the, so they all drain into that uh, and then even the lymph from the abdomen drains into that and then uh, 
uh, it goes into the thoracic duct, which opens into the junction between the deep uh, the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein in the neck. That's how the lymph gets into the bloodstream. Okay, try to answer this. Again, you know, what we just did regarding the inguinal lymph node, medial group of superficial inguinal nodes drain a small part of the uterus. Yes, I said that. Vertical group of superficial inguinal nodes drain the dosum of the foot. Yes, I said except, except the posterior lateral aspect of the leg, all other legs. Deep nodes in the femoral canal drain glands penis. Yes, nodes of clocket. Nodes of clocket drain the skin of the penis. So, this is the same thing. Okay, deep nodes in the femoral canal are the nodes of clocket. Okay. Uh, so, nodes of clocket drain the skin of the penis. No, skin of the penis goes into the medial group of penis nodes. Uh, the clocket's drain the glands penis. Okay, and clitoris in female. So, this is the same uh, thing asked in two different ways. All inguinal nodes final drain into internal iliac, no, it's external iliac. Okay. Mm -hmm.